Hello and welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 23, The Gallic Empire and the Rise of Christianity. 343 AD, 300 years since the arrival of the Romans to the shores of Britain, many of the Roman Britons, it, for many of the Roman Britons, it would be a high water mark. Rome was stable after a long, dark third century. The system appeared once again to be working, and many were prospering. Some of the greatest villas in British history were founded in the early 4th century. Sites which had been abandoned and or destroyed were once again growing. The Sivatas were once again on the rise after a period of genuine decay. The money which had grown almost non-existent had returned to the provinces, and they were again expanding and growing. Few knew that you could see the end coming, and few would have believed you if you had told them. In the last century, Britain almost became a part of a new empire. A new Gallic empire was founded, which combined Gaul, Spain, Britain, and the German holdings to create a new imperium. In 260, Emperor Galenius, ruling alone as emperor, almost oversaw the collapse of Rome. In the chaos of a terribly chaotic century, Galenius lost control of his most proper most prosperous western holdings to Marcus Cassanius Latinius Postumus. A provincial general, Postumus rose to prominence because he was able to set up his own version of the Gallic Empire, as it is called today. Like so many in the past, the usurper had the backing of his soldiers, but unlike so many others, he knew his regional base would not allow him to overthrow Galenius in Rome, so he seemed to have carved out his own empire instead. We're not 100% certain on this. This is Historians have posited this as the reason, uh, effectively because he just didn't have enough military manpower to really go after Glenius. He may have had thoughts of actually eventually taking him on, but he seemed to be taking on more of a, a an underling role, at least initially, or setting himself up as a new kind of emperor of a new kind of empire. Posthumus was a Batavanian, uh, which means which, as we've mentioned previously, was a Germanic tribe that was in the area of what is now Holland, and but they had been in the service of Rome for a very long time at this point. The tribe had actually sent cohorts to Britain in the last century, so typically they were part of the Roman frontier troops, and in this case were actually manning uh, forts in Germany. He came to power, in fact, over an argument of the distribution of booty, and was declared emperor in Germany in northern and northern Gaul in 260, and then by 261 had also claimed Britain and Spain. His reign lasted almost 10 years with his breakaway imperium. He would, as so many before and after, ended up killed by the same troops that had elevated him years earlier. He would claim along the way that far from destroying the emperor, empire, he was seeking to restore it which would have played well amid the chaos of the 3rd century, keeping in mind that the coinage at this point was debased, inflation was out of control, the civatas and the market towns were starting to fall apart because people were returning to their agrarian and, and previous lifestyles, trying to survive all of this chaos, and emperors were coming and going thick and fast. So all of this kind of reflected on what was needed, and what was needed was a strong, stable hand, and it appears that Posthumus at least offered that. He, Because he controlled areas in Spain and in Britain, he actually controlled one of the major points of mining and of specifically precious material. Thus, he was able to make much better coinage than what had previously been done. His coins, in fact, during the period of Galenius and Posthumus, are actually of better make and quality than Galenius's are. And it's fascinating to see how he lined himself up as kind of, you know, the savior of Rome. The British populace themselves may have seen him as a stabilizing force in a period of doubt and decay. The fact that he was able to carve out this niche was not lost on later usurpers or emperors. Diocletian, in fact, reformed the empire into two separate divisions with co-emperors controlling them. He would rule the east and Maximin would rule the west, and under them would be two Caesars to act as successors for the Augustuses, or emperors. These reforms would allow stability to return to Rome for a time and end the chaos of the third century. 
But also, with this stability came a new challenge right as it began. A successful commander, Mausenius Carusius, a Belgic tri tribesman, was declared emperor, this time in Britain in 286. Again, this is a very charismatic individual, a military individual who had military successes. Much like Posthumus, he offered a level of safety and protection and had control of his troops. And you can tell from past accounts that the troops took to their commanders because their commanders, at the end of the day, were the key to how they survived. If they wanted booty, if they wanted money, a commander was a big key to this. So their ability to achieve things came down to how successful their commanders were. So their loyalty was not necessarily always to Rome, but rather to the commanders who led them. So often they would report that these commanders should be the guys leading Rome because, you know, those pinheads back home, to use a better word, would be useless, and these guys knew how to really run things. So once again, in this case, uh, Caricius leads the troops becomes that charismatic leader who gains attention. Again, he creates sympathy in Roman Britain, probably the citizens who remembered Posthumus, who seemed to lead a stable and lengthy leadership in an era when Roman emperors were disappearing faster than you can imagine. They would have probably looked back on that fondly as young children, as you would any sort of situation where you have peace for a while, and then it gets torn apart by someone else. So the fact that he was offering a similar type of situation, and this time in a form of a British empire, must have appealed to them and must have made him seem to be heroic in a way. Interestingly enough, none of these usurpers ever appealed to themselves as being, you know, to the independent British idea or the independent Gallic idea. It was more about the idea that they were bringing back the old Roman forms, the old Roman Empire. This wasn't, you know, this wasn't a case of them going on their own to create an independent empire away from Rome. That may have been the consequence, but that wasn't the desire, and that wasn't the point, and that wasn't how they sort of sold themselves. In this case, he was able to expand his empire into Gaul, and tried to sneak his way into the imperial good graces by actually arguing for a tetrarchy. So in other words, he was trying to offer himself as a third imperial option, or a third Augustus controlling the western, most western provinces. That went over like a lead balloon, needless to say, with Diocletian, who wasn't terribly impressed with him. And so by 293, so only seven years later, he was actually murdered. He was replaced by Electicus, who likely was an effective administrator, but appeared to be a lousy leader. He was considered by both historians and sources to be uninspiring. By 296, however, the might of Rome arrived and killed off Electicus, finishing the last gasp of the early British Empire. For at all his uh, monetary and other successes, Electicus just couldn't lead him a paper bag, it seemed like. And with the arrival of the 4th century, there was a reorganization of the empire under Constantine. Roman Britain entered a, both a more stable and more orderly period for a number of years to come. Uh, Diocletian, who, who was the emperor before Constantine, set up a total of four provinces in Britain and set up four governors to run them. Likely, this was to kind of keep the presumption of a particular leader from trying to run the area and then creating yet another break-off group. However, in doing that, they also set up a military commander called the Dux Britarium, uh, who was leader of the Roman British military. This role would have consequences in later centuries as it morphed from the empire into independent kingdoms. And we start to see this with the idea of the high commander or the high king. And it, as I say, will have consequences in the early Middle Ages and late antiquity. As Rome falls off, this position still remains important. But it was set up in the 300s by Diocletian. Um, at the same time that all of this is going on, Christianity arrives in Britain officially as both a state religion under Constantine and with its own set of problems and controversies. 
things like iconoclasm, orthodoxy, heretical teachings, and eventually the rise of Pelagianism will lead Christianity into becoming the dominant religion in Roman Britain for a while. Popular mythology claims that Joseph of Arimathea introduced Christianity into Britain in 63 AD when he brought the Holy Grail to Glastonbury after the crucifixion of Christ. However, obviously this is a myth and very unlikely, but it's a convenient way to connect to early followers of Christianity to Britain. Since there was no direct mention of the faith in Britain by our sources in the first or second centuries, it's pretty hard to accept that there was any sort of main British Christianity. One could actually argue that, if anything, Christianity was barely barely moving the needle in, in Roman Britain at the time. And typically, when we look around, there's no... There's great difficulty finding archaeological sites that would show that there was a movement of Christianity into Britain. One of the things you find in Rome and other places where Christianity starts to take hold in this era of the early church fathers is you end up with uh, symbolisms, right? Like graves have markings that are Christian. There are Christian graffiti put around. There's none of that really in Roman Britain at this point, so there's nothing to really point that they had expanded that far. However, by the 3rd century, this all has changed, and in fact, we get our first contemporary source, which mentions the idea of British Christians. Early Christian fathers, such as Origen, for example, uh, mentioned that Christianity had reached the island by his day. This is, of course, at the end of, at the, end of the second and the beginning of the 3rd century. And what we're finding is that Previously, there was a lot of confusion as to when Christianity came to Britain, particularly when you have competing ideas that somehow Christianity was lost from Britain at one point and had to come back. Uh, that has proven to probably be untrue. However, this is not helped by our sources, who actually kind of engage a little bit of this. Uh, in fact, when talking about when Christianity came to Britain, you have sources that conflict with what may or may not have happened, and debating how generous the amount of Christianity there was. Uh, these sources include Bede and Ninius, two monks, one British, one Anglo-Saxon. They have very different ideas on, obviously, because they're on either side of the huge wars that were going on at the time. So both of them are very different in how they view things, but the one thing that they both look at is the early Christian settlement of Britain. And Bede tells us that it began with a guy called uh, Lucius, who was supposedly a British king, although how many British kings do they have at that time? And it says that in Bede's case, he mentions that Lucius asked for a personal conversion from Pope Ithilurius, uh in 156 AD. Now, we don't know much, and there's some... Uh, mentions of his lineage going back to Caractacus, which, again, eh, that's probably sketchy at best. So the sources aren't terribly great here, and there's a reason why I'm going to pose this. The other thing that happens is you have Ninius, who then goes on to say that because this guy was baptized, this actually spread Christianity to Britain. But we know for a fact that there's no evidence that Christianity existed in large measure in Britain before the 300s. So in all likelihood, that's untrue. There is Christianity within Britain. We know that, in especially in the 3rd century. But the 1st and 2nd centuries are very unlikely to have had Christianity in the island in any main form. And all the reasons I said earlier. But as well, it's you already have a conflicting report between two authors who are within a couple hundred years of each other, but both of whom are three to four hundred years away from the original supposed event, or in this case, up to 900 years away. So you really don't have direct source evidence that we know of. And to add to this is Gildas, who actually exists as a monk in the 6th century writing about this kind of stuff in Wales. And he talks about none of this. So for that point alone, it's kind of like, well, if Gildas isn't talking about it, unless these guys have got sources I, that are unlikely, and the best mention that they get of this is some line in a book from Italy which mentions the idea of this King Lucius 
other than that, we really don't have a lot of detail. And so there's not a lot of information that we can point to and say, yeah, they're obviously right or wrong. But by the third century, one thing we do have is we have Christian martyrs. And the first British Christian martyrs are Alban, Aaron, and Julius. They were all killed for their faith in either the late third or early fourth century. Julius is an interesting case because he's the first Welsh located martyr as he was killed in either Carleon or Carwent. So already we have a link with Wales and Christianity. All this means that Christianity was a feature of life in Britain in the late Roman period, so much so that by 314, uh, three British bishops attended the Council of Arles, which was the forerunner of the Council of Nicaea, which set in motion the tenets of the Trinity, what was orthodoxy in the Catholic Church, basically. These three bishops are Restatus, the Bishop of London, Iborius of York, and Aldefadius of Lincoln. Interesting where they're all located at. They're all located in English uh, civitas, but it also points out that there was a British Christianity and a big enough one to send bishops to a council meeting in Gaul. So it, there is a degree of faith movement there. And part of the reason they were there was to be in attendance to denounce Donatism, which had appealed to the to the emperor to be recognized at a point when Christianity was about to be recognized as the official state religion. So you have this idea of late antiquity creating a Christian faith in Britain, and the Roman Britons will rely on that faith quite often and will depend on it and in some ways become immersed into the problems of it with paganism and the eventual split of the so-called Celtic Church from the Catholic Church in Anglo-Saxon England and the conflict that will begin between the two over rights and, and issues of that nature and who basically should be in charge of the island. And there will be a lot of accusations that we'll talk about with Bede about who's responsible for what happened and why. But it's interesting to see that, that Roman Christianity was already here at this point, and so it it wasn't like the Roman Britons had forgotten about it. And it still existed up until the Anglo-Saxons arrive and begin their conquest. The question becomes, of course, why then did most of these Roman Britons then fall into pagan practices with the Anglo-Saxons, and that's something we're going to discuss later down the road. And even in some of the areas that were still Roman Britain, it seemed like they disappeared as well, to the point where they were being called out quite vigorously by Gildas for their backsliding. So all of these things are going on in the in the 4th century as we kind of begin to excel towards something better for Roman Britain at this point. The stability that was brought about by Diocletian's reforms actually gives us about a, almost 100 years of peace. It gives the Roman Britons time to acquire more wealth. The expansion of the Roman British lifestyle will become much better, uh, much healthier because of the lack of chaos and the, and the problems that were happening with inflation and the devaluation of the coinage. And all of this brings us to the point where Rome breaks up. <laughs> and so in our next episode, we're going to talk a lot more in depth about the eventual breakup of the Roman Empire, how a guy named uh, Maximus becomes such a big part of that and becomes sort of the last pretender to come out of Britain to try and take over the Roman Empire. And it becomes the last gasp of Roman Britain before the end of the line. And so that will be the subject of our next episode. I hope you will join us there. I look forward to talking about this subject as we get closer and closer to the Middle Ages and all of the developments that will happen for Wales then and we get away from being a Roman Britain and into a Britain that is British with Welsh tribes becoming important and the Anglo-Saxon arrival, which we're going to talk in depth about in the next few episodes as we go forward, because, of course, that's going to become the next major conflict for the Roman British, who then have become the British. 
And until next week, I just like to thank everybody for listening and be sure once again, if you haven't already, to take a look at our raffle, which we've got going on. If you donate $5 or more, you can be entered into a raffle to either receive a $25 uh, Amazon gift card or a Welsh history book called The History of Wales by John Davis. And until next time, thank you, everyone. We'll talk to you later and have a great day. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.